Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. I am from the Bay Area, and I haven't been back for 10 years. So it's great to be here, and especially in the occasion of uh, speaking to you today about my new book, The Emissary, which I'm pretty excited about, and moreover, about the general situation with the whales and dolphins and the oceans of our planet. So I am particularly interested in the music of the whales and dolphins, and the last books that I've done the Before We Leave You, which was the book Before the Emissary, which is also available tonight, and The Emissary, which is my first novel, are about the potential communication from whales, particularly whales and dolphins, for the human race. One is extremely esoteric. How many of you go there? Oh, I figured if you came to hear me speak, you probably have that esoteric bent. And one is pretending to be fiction, but also contains a lot of that information, and that's the emissary. I say pretending because already some of the critics that have reviewed the book say there's a lot of Patricia Corey in her main character, and perhaps uh, there's a lot more truth than fiction in the story, which thrills me because, indeed, I think the message in the emissary that I hope you will read speaks to a lot of truth about what's going on on this planet. So let's talk about some of the problems I like to talk about problems first so that when you talk about the solutions, you're grounded in some sort of balance of what's really going on. I think that the military programs that have been put in place for the next five years for uh, our basic attacks on the ocean, and one of the primary things that's going to be done is outrageous, unbearable sonar blasting on many key locations around the United States. One of these locations is right in the middle of a right whale nesting haven. All, all holes are off. They're gonna be blasting sonar right in through those centers and they will, the right whales are already facing extinction. These sonar blasts are so intense, they're going to kill, they're going to destroy these, these havens. The Navy sonar programs are not only limited to the sonar that we already know about, they're also gonna be working with new high-powered ultrasound laser weapons. And it's quite a, uh, a challenge for the whales and dolphins because you know that these animals have highly sensitive oral cavities. The whale's brain or the dolphin's brain registers pressure, any kind of, any kind of pressure that would be, uh, let's say even remotely identified as sound resonates through this oral chamber. And we're finding whales and dolphins from these blasts, not only from the military, but also from oil companies. Even fishing boats use, so use sonar. Not the dramatic, drastic stuff that the Navy's using, but uh, enough sonar to disturb the sounds of the ocean. Did you know that a humpback whale can make a melodic pattern, a song, that can be up to 35, 40 minutes long without repeating itself? You know that. Good for you. Did you also know that a, a humpback can sing, send out a call, and it can reach 1,000 miles away? Got you there. 1,000 miles away? I have a friend whose name is Peter Lavigne. He's working with a... Um, a device that he's developed, which looks like a conch shell, only it's made out of some sort of uh, pl plastic, perhaps, that he can use underwater. He developed it at Stanford University with some engineers there, but um, he's a musician, and they developed this conch shell that, can play, that he plays to, to sound like a humpback whale call. And he goes to French Guadeloupe, and he goes underwater with the humpback whales and he plays for them and they repeat back to him the song that he plays. And then he's got people stationed in different locations all over the world. And these are marine biologists, people that are in the water with the humpbacks studying this work. And they say, we've got the call. We've got the same music that you just played. So the whales, the beautiful whales, the brilliant higher consciousness beings of this planet are relaying music around the planet 
whale to whale, ocean to ocean. Something's going on here, and I think it's bigger than just uh, mating calls and how to play today in the warmer waters that are coming up through the, uh, the channel. So that's what Before We Leave You is about. I hope you'll read it. And here today, I'm, to talk, I'm here to talk to you about my wild adventure writing The Emissary. I've written 13, this is my 13th book now, including two books that I co-authored, and this is my first novel. And people are saying, but why are you crossing genres from metaphysical nonfiction to fiction? And one of the reasons is so that I can hopefully reach more people who aren't, like many of you, aware of these aspects and who maybe don't even want to hear about higher purpose of whales and dolphins. They're supposed to jump through hoops and entertain us uh, so that I can hopefully reach them without uh, terrorizing their consciousness about here comes some new age information and help them embrace the possibility of the real purpose of whales and dolphins on this planet and in so doing, just possibly, activate people to start doing something about it. So this story, has anyone here read it yet? Oh, this is good. Okay, so you know already, and you know that there's a twists and turns in the story that I'm not gonna give away. But uh, it is about a psychic. I've been told she might resemble me, my main character, and I do confess that there is a little bit of me. She's from San Francisco, she's a psychic, and she loves the whales and dolphins, so. Then she takes her own way and becomes her own character. But uh, it's a story of a, of a calamity of three things that occur on planet Earth simultaneously. And these three things have occurred on planet Earth simultaneously. We have, in the opening of the story, uh, a man is in Los Angeles driving home from work, and he stops to chat to a friend. And as they're standing in the street talking, five, six hundred blackbirds drop dead. Alfred, Hitch Alfred Hitchcock-esque drop dead on the street all around them, just pound them uh, and lie dead, not even dying, instantaneously. And then the story goes to a next vignette on the east coast of Maine, where a woman is going out to picnic with her children, and tens of thousands of fish lie dying on the beach. And this is a, a native to Maine. She knows that it had to have just happened because there's no stench, there's no nothing, nobody heard about this. So she knows it's an instantaneous event, and she runs back in the house terrified to think that some sort of chemical or or some sort of calamity has taken place that she's not aware of. And at the same time, on the other side of the planet, in New Zealand, 150 whales lie dead and dying, whales and dolphins. And who is there vacationing but Jamie Hastings, the heroine of the story? She is a renowned psychic. She works with the LA Police Department and does also corporate dousing and things like this, so she's a substantially qualified psychic uh, researcher, and she's there to get away from it all because she's been working with identifying murderers and all kinds of things that are the less, the seedier side of being a psychic, and she's there to, to just uh, regroup and get away from it. And what happens, what happens to her but that she ends up in the middle of this disaster because this these whales and di uh, sorry, dolphins are dying on this resort beach where she is. And so she's catapulted into the drama where she goes to help out to try to save some of these animals. But they're gigantic humpback whales. I hope none of you ever have or ever will have to see a whale dying on the beach. They're immense, and they can't be. Once they're beached, it's very difficult that they're ever going to be saved. And in that process of, of coping with trying to help, uh, she, she, she goes up to a humpback mother whale. She knows that she's just about to give birth, this whale. And she has a psychic communication looking into the eyes of this whale. She goes deep into the soul of this mother and her baby. And as they die, Jamie helps them over the bridge, the rainbow bridge, to the other side. 
And this catapults her on a journey that uh, involves going out on a ship to, to, to work as a psychic researcher on a ship because somebody gets a hold of the fact that she is a dowser and he's got an oil company that's going up to, out into the Pacific to look for oil. And he persuades her and convinces her that even though that would be the antithesis of what she is all about, if she will do this for him, he will, it will be all the more probable that they won't tear up the ocean floor and that in a perverse way, that effort on her part may very well be the thing that helps save the whales and dolphins. So she agrees to go. And what happens on that ship is stuff you've just got to read. Exciting, thrilling, frightening, um, and just a little bizarre. And she opens up communications with the whales and dolphins. And they tell her, look, if you don't help us, they're, 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 this whole planet is going to go down. So there's this other aspect to the story, which is another aspect of reality that I like to talk about. And that is, uh, what is, what are these weapons that are being used on the planet that are affecting our environments? What would cause 500, 600 birds to drop dead instantaneously, or 20 or 30,000 fish to drop dead instantaneously on the shore, and all of these whales and dolphins, which I've already alluded to. And the book alludes to this little base in Alaska. Do you know what I'm talking about? Harp. You're good. <laughs> Yeah, there's this little base in Alaska called HARP that's emitting extremely low frequency waves around our planet. There are a, a lot of things that are happening on this planet militaristically that we are unaware of. And one of them is this uh, HARP, proliferation of these HARP weapons. And I think that they're dramatically affecting the oceans as well. The US military has openly declared that they're going to take, their word is take, and this is in writing, and you can, you can read about it if you so are inclined. They petitioned to NOAA, which is the fisheries organization um, that oversees the, uh, let's say, the strategic activities of ships in our oceans. And they petitioned them for five-year permission to take, to, to, to conduct these um, exercises, bombs, chemicals, sonar, laser sonar, and every manner of weapon they so choose for five-year programs to protect us against whatever, the ubiquitous terrorists or whatever we're being protected against. And they regret that there will be a uh, potential take, uh, collateral damage, of 13, read my lips, million marine animals. And if you look where you read take, there's a little asterisk, and it says maim, kill, destroy, uh, injure. They're talking about killing 13 million whales and dolphins. Well, I've got news for you. The world can't take the loss of 13 million whales and dolphins in five years. Your grandchildren won't see whales and dolphins after that. Not to mention what that would mean for the vibrations in the oceans. That metaphysical question of, is this music somehow holding the frequencies of the sea in some sort of balance? And I think it is. And I think if, the, if those calls and that music is gone, we're going to see a very different planet here. And so it's of the utmost importance for us to become involved here. Now, let's talk about the Gulf of Mexico. What happened in the Gulf of Mexico? Yeah, it's still, it's not a spill. It's a hole. It's a crevasse. This stuff just keeps coming out, right? It was the result of too much drilling, wasn't it? Too many, that, that's what one of the themes of the, of the emissary is when the, Matt Anderson, the, the uh, president of this oil company says, before we go in there and dredge up the whole ocean floor, help us find these pockets so we don't damage the, 
rip apart the ocean floor. But in the Gulf, we've been told the Gulf is a mess. The Gulf floor is so ravaged by so much drilling and uh, what do they call it, dredging, et cetera, that it's simply leaking. There are, it's not drill sites now. There, there's just oil just coming up. Are you aware of this? Now, I admit, I tend to see some, I tend to be a little bit of a conspiracy nut. But they used to call me a conspiracy theorist, and now I'm a conspiracy realist because a lot of these things have come to pass. So I coined the phrase, and I'm happy to share it with you, conspiracy realist, because it's true. What, why have we not been able to do better in the Gulf of Mexico than to spread core exit all over this water, this body of water, which is, by the way, terribly punny, core exit. I think it's got a little humor to it there. The truth is, I think it's very possible that they don't want to heal this part of the world. And I've recently found out that they're growing biofuels in the Gulf. You don't suppose that it's possible that this was deliberately done and that the, the, the Gulf is now a biofuel Breeding, breeding ground. Do any of you know what I'm talking about, about the growing of biofuels in the Gulf? No, okay, well, investigate that if you're interested because there are pockets of that part of the ocean that are being cultivated to create biofuels. And I, I'm, unfortunately, I don't know what that entails. I'm not a chemist, but um, I think that the, the thirst for fuel when we know that there are so many other alternatives to fuel as we understand it, is distorted from the beginning with, f with fracking and all the other things that are going on, this thirst to get more fuel. America has a glut on fuel now, did you know that? America's never had that much fuel as it has now. And I would like to suggest that whatever the reason, whether it is in fact true that this body of water is being used, to create new gra breeding grounds for some sort of biofuel, or whatever they're developing, that we need our oceans back. We need our oceans back. We need the marine life to return. And the Gulf is almost dead, guys. Whales and dolphins are, are dying in the Gulf. Please don't go to Florida, by the way, and eat shrimp. That would not be a good idea. <laughs> so, uh, Yes. I'm, I'm interested in, um, what about organizations like Greenpeace? And, and they have a lot to do on the, what, what organizations should be looking into this? So if you want to help, I've just started an organization called Save Earth's Oceans, Inc. We're small. I'm not struggling. I don't like to put that word out. But we're building, and uh, we're at the beginning. And one of the things that I'm out there screaming about is the sonar. As many people as possible need to know about this. And what we, the tools we've got to work with when we talk about the military industrial complex at the moment are petitions. We don't have the money to fight the industrial complex, but there are politicians who really do care. And to your question about wh who should we work with, what organizations, I want to tell you a little bit about Sea Shepherd in case you haven't heard. Uh, about two or three weeks ago, we got an amazing good news report that finally made it to the mainstream news. And that was that Japan has been stopped for their research whaling. What happens is the Japanese uh, whalers go out, they've got these big red letters on their ships that say research, and they're going out and they're just slaughtering all these whales. You know, excuse me, whales are such easy targets. If you've ever been out on a boat, to call it hunting is ridiculous. Many whales, cetaceans, come up near you. They're curious about human beings. They like to play. They like to investigate. I've had whales come right up to the boat. In fact, even a blue whale, which is, can be up to 30 feet long or 30 meters long. Big animals, I'm talking. The biggest animal on this planet. 
And I've had one come up so close, I thought, this is where the boat capsizes and I'm out of here because the, the, this gigantic whale was right next to the boat. And they're curious. They, they re there's some dynamic going on here. The dynamic that I talked about earlier in the evening before you got here, which is I think we're going to open communication very soon now. And they're no, this isn't hunting. They're just pulling them out of the water. So the Japanese research vessels have been going to town in the Antarctic. And Sea Shepherd, and I'm honored to say that I am friends with Captain Paul. He's a hero. He's also a searched criminal on the planet, so everything is about perspective, isn't it? Um, but uh, he lives on ships, and they go after the whalers. And he risks his life every day. He takes no corporate money, and it, he survives. They survive on uh, donations. And I would like to also refer to a wonderful man named Hardy Jones, who has an organization called bluevoice.org. He's also my friend. And Hardy's approach is, let's educate people to the fact that eating whale meat or dolphin meat is certain death by showing them the toxicity in this meat. Let's, instead of telling them they can't do it, which is only, you don't, I don't know about you, but if somebody says I can't do something, I'm going to go right out and do it because I don't take commands. <laughs> so let's educate them instead of what this means to them when they eat the meat. Did you know, I mean, there are hundreds of tons of whale meat in freezers in the Orient, um, and, and, the, and in Japan particularly. So there's a lot of focus on Japan right now, and there are a lot of Japanese people very angry with their own whaling communities and trying to, to change that reality. And sea shepherds are there, and a lot of other conser uh, whale conserv conservationists are focused on talgy, they're, they're focused on the whaling industry in Japan and trying to change that. But it's not only Japan. They're eating whale burgers in Iceland. And you know, these animals are, are they're, they're migrating up to Iceland. I have a house in the Azores Island and whales and dolphins migrate past the Azores. It's plentiful in the summer. There's all these different species of cetaceans. And I wonder, will they survive? Or are they headed for Iceland, where it's fair kill? Or the Faroe Islands, another one. You know about the Faroe Islands? The Faroe Islands, they have a ritual every summer where they, they just go out in the water and they just start slaughtering the dolphins for, it's a, it's a rite of passage for young men. The Faroe Islands, they are off somewhere off the coast of, um, please help me, Denmark in the North Sea. Does anybody know where they are specifically? It's a terrifying thing. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, and I don't want to leave you with uh, a sad feeling. What I would like to say is we can change this. And Blackfish, the movie Blackfish, is doing wonders. SeaWorld is in trouble. It was on TV? Wonderful. Have you seen this movie, Blackfish? There's a new consciousness about whales and dolphins. The, the wonderful Blackfish movie has, has openly um, taught people about the horrors of what's happening to these marine mammals in these sea worlds. Their treatment of them, these cages they're in, and referring back to my earlier message about the music of the oceans, the music, they need the music to live. They, they, they need the music to, to, to exist at that higher purpose. And so they're in these little cages. They're, we've got so many whales that are dying in these places. They have much shorter lives. So that humans can sit there and eat popcorn and watch them jump through hoops. We can do better than that, folks. We need to do better than that. Well, sometimes when I'm talking to a really out their audience. I will say something like, imagine if we were on another, if, if aliens took over the planet Earth and they thought that humans would be so much fun to put into circus acts and watch us jump through hoops. You know, we would think that would be pretty horrible and yet we're allowing it and we're frequenting these places. This is, we can do better. And that's my mission. We want to do better, we must do better because these beings 
are some of the most magical, incredible, beautiful beings on our planet. And we are the guardians. We're the, the ones with the brains, supposedly. And so we can definitely put a thorn in the side of these military intentions. And we're eight billion people. If we can start this expansion process of more and more people taking action, words, clean up the beaches, sign a petition, donate to your favorite organization, uh, we will change the world. So um, I've got only five minutes left right now. So I'm going to read you, uh, instead of what I was going to read you a lot of, I'm going to read you the last two pages of The Emissary, which I feel are appropriate. I get stage fright when I read, and <laughs> here we go. I know why I get stage fright. It's because my glasses aren't as good as they used to be. <laughs> here we go. Some perceive Earth and all the life it sustains as a great conscious being, one mind, one body, and soul. Others are so disconnected, they cannot feel the very heart of her, nor hear the song of Mother Earth, which lives somewhere deep within us all, but which, for them, lies buried in silence. There are those who realize how infinitely small we are in the great expanse of the universe, and how this universe is just as infinitely small in the vastness of the cosmos of soul. And there are others who live in separation, a sensate physical experience into which they believe they appeared from nothingness, passing through this earthly plane for just this one brief journey to then disappear back to nowhere. Whether ours is the only celestial life-bearing station in the cosmos is yet another conundrum seeking resolution, bouncing us back and forth between the poles that define that ambiguous expanse of possible realities we call human consciousness. More and more of us embrace the idea that we are far from alone in the universe, yet still others deny with vehemence that life, or at least intelligent life, could possibly spring from the same elements that surely exist on other countless spinning wheels in the great beyond. Such is the duality of our earthly experience. Here, on this little blue dot in space, a great drama is playing out for all humanity, the struggle of darkness and light. We have faced it before, and we will surely pass this way again. For as long as the earth is plagued with the misfortune of possessing an overabundance of mineral resources, there will be those who insist on destroying every living thing to exploit and possess those resources. There will be infinite wars fought for the most insignificant reasons, but always there will be a healing, a return to harmony. There will be beings of darkness and beings of light, of light from the earth and from beyond, drawn into the drama to help reestablish the balance and right the scales, as there are now. This dynamic tension is forever threatening to tilt the world to either side, to the dark side or to the light. And there may never be a time of final resolution, but rather a perpetual, infinite field of opportunity where each of us will choose to build or destroy, to love or to hate, to give birth or to kill. The questions of our existence are endless. The answers for those who cannot see beyond, those who dare not think outside the confines of limitation, lie waiting to be discovered, the hidden. At the bottom of the great oceans, through the eye of a mighty whale, in one's own subconscious, spinning somewhere out in space, the treasure chest lies waiting to be discovered, unlocked and revealed. We hold the keys. If only we will free our minds and open our hearts and listen to the music of the earth.